morning, I'm Dave. I pastor what is now a multi-campus uh, church called Yakima Foursquare. Uh, today, uh, Scott Ruark is being commissioned as the senior pastor of Sela Covenant Church, so that's happening today. We're calling it a church partnership. Uh, we're excited about what God's doing. Uh, as Jacob and uh, Andy uh, talked about our gift to the world, we have this information out in our Connection Center just so you can connect to the different projects that we intend uh, to focus this year's gift on. And uh, just this morning, I wanted to see how much money we Americans spend on ourselves at Christmas. Uh, so you Google that and up it comes, $465 billion we Americans will spend on ourselves this Christmas. And what's interesting about that to me is that $30 billion would end the water crisis on the entire earth, which uh, 2,000 kids die uh, daily or weekly uh, from waterborne disease because of unclean drinking water. But one of the other projects that we're going to focus on this year is a uh, pastoral training school in Pakistan. Uh, we've already built one there. Uh, there's another one operating in a rented facility uh, that's very, very dangerous. It's right along the Afghanistan border, uh, the Taliban area. Uh, we've got 300 pastors that have been trained and have moved on. And uh, we want to, again, uh, build another pastoral training school uh, in this particular area that is safer, uh, better guarded, uh, better cared for. And uh, that's what, uh, again, a piece of this. So you'll see pictures. There's uh, Harold Eberly with his nice headgear on there, the guy in the, in, in the middle there. Uh, Harold is with WorldCast and one of our favorite people in all the earth. And uh, we've continued to help him. We built this school uh, several years ago with our gift to the world. Um, so again, we, we're doing great things in this part of the earth. And uh, we're excited about it and are once again this year uh, going to contribute. We also, depending on the size of the gift, which we never know how generous you all are going to be. And, uh, but there's a, a need uh, for a refuge center in essence because uh, when people give their lives to to uh, Christ, oftentimes they're thrown out of their family setting. The persecution begins immediately and they need a place to go. And uh, so that's another piece of the project that we're hoping to put together. You know, during the season of Advent, as a church, we try to focus uh, on Jesus. Uh, we know that it's a great time to buy gifts and I'm not trying to discourage you from doing that. How many of you, by the way, are all done with your Christmas shopping? Raise your hand if you're completely, that is sick. <laughs> I only have to buy for one person and I just can't get going. It's so hard. So difficult, and some of you are already done. That is just crazy to me, crazy to me. But what's interesting is you think about Christmas and what it's become. Again, if you buy into everything that it's all about, we completely forgot about Thanksgiving this year. We went right into Christmas. And, and yet, on December 26th, there, there's almost a darkness that falls over us because the season actually begins to disappoint. And the truth is that it's disappointing some even before it comes. It just hasn't been what it was intended to be, this time of celebration of who Jesus is. And uh, we've been looking at the attributes of God on display in this uh, Christmas narrative. And what I hope that you will do with me is that we want to steward as a people of God, Christmas. And we want to steward it well as Advent, that Latin word which means coming or arrival. And again, we've looked back at Christ and the Advent as a baby, but it's also about marveling about who he is now in his spirit, active and working and transforming people's lives. I loved the transformed life as, as a part of what God is doing. But we also look forward to his second coming, the promised return of Christ. And in that day, in that day, what has become a shadow, Christmas, uh, will in 
reality be delivered to us so that we know and understand how glorious and awesome God really is in his second coming. So I wanna take you now to a place where we look at the glory of God. We've talked about him as our deliverer. We've talked about his compassion and his reconciliatory work on the cross. Now we wanna talk about the glory of God. I'm gonna take you to a very familiar story in Luke chapter two. Let me read it to you. It's on the screen behind you, on the app if you have it. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as had been told to them. Again, a very familiar story, yet I don't think we recognize today how tremendously scandalous this story would have been as it was told and as it was unfolding that Jesus, in fact, had included shepherds in what was going on as he entered into humanity. Again, for us, this imagery is redeemed. We think the shepherds were awesome guys and gals. But in the first century, you couldn't get much lower than a shepherd. Uh, Let me tell you a little bit about them. We look at history. Shepherds could not hold public office. Their testimony was not admissible as evidence in a court of law. The most pious of Jews would not buy milk or kids, which is not a child, but a, a baby sheep, or, or wool from shepherds because they just assumed that it was stolen. And what was occurring during this period of time is that shepherds would take the sheep and head sometimes months away from the owner's property to find land on which the sheep could graze. And as those sheep began to multiply, have kids, uh, they, they didn't have a way of marking them, so the the shepherds would literally steal their master's sheep and would sell the wool and the milk as their own and make the money off of their theft. So first century, again, pious Jews had a boycott against buying anything from shepherds, namely wool and milk and kids. But when you start to really look at it, you see the systematic injustice in this because the way that these shepherds were paid was with sheep and wool and milk. So they were paid that way, but then they couldn't turn around and resell it to get the things that they needed to live on. These people were considered the lowest of the low. They were vagrants, they were thieves, they were dirty, and because of what they did for a living, they couldn't even go into the temple to worship God. Because they handled the animal and because of their supposed lifestyle, they were literally not allowed to come into the church of the day, the temple, to make a sacrifice or to worship God. They were despised and rejected. So, think about how crazy this is. Moments after the birth of Jesus, the heralding of the good news of the gospel did not come to that pious ruling elite It didn't come to those who uh, were following all of the rules, who were tithing and doing all the things that they were supposed to do. Instead, the angels came to these shepherds. And I think you see what Jesus is all about because those who couldn't come to him, he actually went to them. 
And one of the things I love about this particular story is that this word glory is often translated weight, so the weight of God showed up. And I actually love that. One of the things I've discovered through the course of my life trying to walk with Jesus is that oftentimes he'll put me in situations where I get squeezed. And doggone it, if when I get squeezed, doesn't stuff come out that I didn't even know was there? And I'm not very excited is still there. The weight, the glory of God just has a way of pushing those things that just aren't good for us and don't bring glory to God out of us. So again, I love this word because when the glory of God shows up, it reshapes and it reorders. It pushes out and it breaks free. There's nothing as weighty in all of the universe as the glory of God. When the glory of God shows up, it changes everything. It changes everything. The weight of God, when it shows up among us, and what's interesting, if you would have talked about where the glory of God would have first shown up after the birth of Jesus, the shepherds would not have been on the top 100 list. They wouldn't have been there. And yet that's who God showed up to. And what I would love us to do today is to look at what happens when the glory of God shows up and hope, and hope that it'll show up for us. That it'll show up for us. It's interesting, the glory of God is, because it was already there that night. It was already there. One of the fun things about my life is this incredible woman that I've married. And my granddaughters asked their mother the other day to sing the song that grandma sings. So my daughter's trying to figure out all the songs that Susie sang to them when they were little and she she just couldn't figure out what song it is. And she finally asked these three-year-old twin granddaughters, what song does grandma sing? And they go, you know. (laughs) My beautiful wife hums all the time. If I want to know where she is, I just have to quiet myself and listen because wherever she's in the house, she's humming. There's this little quiet song going on all the time. I love to ask her what she's humming because she never knows. She never knows what song she's actually humming. So what I'm saying to you is that much like that, that there's always this song going on in my house. You know, I don't know about you, but once in a while, I like to amp it up a little bit. I like to turn my music up, especially back in the old days. I used to really like to crank it up. I mean, I used to like it on 9 and 10. I used to really like to amp it up. What What I'm saying to you is this is that the presence of God is always there. If you believe what our Bible tells us, if you read what our Bible says, you will recognize that the glory of God is always there. But every once in a while, it really, really gets amped up. And that's what happened in this situation. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And here's what happens when the glory of the Lord shows up sometimes. I would say much of the time. When the glory of God shows up, it exposes us for who we are. It exposes us for who we are. The most consistent thing people say to me when I have conversations with them about religion, and I just had one of these the other day, is almost everyone thinks that they're a good person. I'm a good person. They really have no concept of God ever being frustrated or upset with them. Now, some of you, by the grace of God, have that understanding, and you feel the weight of that. When the glory of God shows up, it exposes that. You can't just push off the idea that you're a good person. When the glory of God shows up, it exposes, and people are terrified. And again, everybody thinks they're a good person because we grade on a, on a sliding scale. But when you see the glory of God show up, we will all of a sudden lose our swagger. Every bit of our confidence and self-justification will be gone because the glory of God exposes us 
for who we really are. And if you read your Bible, and this happens over and over and over again, but when Isaiah lays his eyes on God, he just simply says, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the king. He just falls on his face. When John, the disciple who Jesus loves, when when Jesus shows up to him in in, uh, Revelations, he just literally falls to the ground like a dead man. And it happens over and over and over when the glory of God shows up. It exposes us for who we are. And we are acutely aware of our deep and desperate need for a Savior. You catch that? Our deep and desperate need for a Savior. The glory of God. But that's not all the glory of God does. The story continues. And the angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. When the glory of God shows up, it drives out fear and replaces it with joy. Now I think one of the most incredible things about the glory of God, and I know this is true in my conversion experience, is that, yeah, you know, I immediately felt this, this need to be saved. But the minute I said yes to Jesus, this peace flushed over me, and I recognized and realized, and this joy filled my heart. Because, yeah, I knew who I was, but I also knew in that instant I was redeemed. And my life was now forever changed. It exposes where we've fallen short because it knows all things, it sees all things, it knows the motives behind all things. But this declaration to fear not, in John 3, 17, not 16, but 17, it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And again, that's the realization that comes to us when the glory of God shows up. Christ is born and it's like a a life wrap raft in a in a sea of condemnation and death and destruction and all we have to do is climb on board to be saved from that condemnation which is present in the world I think all of the time the good news is that God has made a way for us when there was no way that's the good news and the good news brings great joy and it just literally changes the way we do life and we live When the glory of God shows up, it creates a trust in the word of God. I love this. When the angels went away uh, from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem to see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to this. And and again, this is so amazing to me, the reasoning that they have in the text. They said, hey, they said this has just happened. Let's go see. Let's go see. And I think sometimes we get a little crusty around the edges, especially if we've been doing this Christian thing for a long time. Our childlike wonderment about the glory of God can fade. But I love what these shepherds, they're just simply saying, hey, the Lord revealed it, let's go see it. So when I read the word of God and it says generosity changes the inner man and that generosity pleases the heart of God, I wanna say, God said it, let's go see it. And again, for us, we do this all the time. We've got a, 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 a hallway right behind that wall filled with presents for foster kids. Uh, we've already given great presents to, to, to another group of kids from around the world. We're getting ready to receive an offering in a week that's going to go to radically change the world. And we've understood that that generosity changes us. And it's amazing. When I read the word of God and it calls me to be a husband who loves my wife like Jesus loves the church, and I said, that's what the Bible says, that's what I'm gonna do. And I realized 30 some years later as others' marriages are falling apart that it's because of what Jesus has done in my life that I'm still incredibly happily married because Jesus said it and I do it. Our children What happens when a parent puts kindling around the souls of their children? Jesus said to do it, and he shows up. The glory of God builds our confidence. When we see the weight of God, the splendor of God, the might of God, we're driven into a confidence in the word of God that it's true, and that if we just follow what it says, that our life is gonna be good. Again, 
They got up and said, let's go see. And it took sacrifice. It took risk. It took faith. But they were rewarded. They got to see the Christ child. When the glory of God shows up, it changes our outlook on the monotony of day-to-day living. That's the last of my points today. You know, the shepherds returned, and you know what they returned to? The same exact conditions that they left. They still could not testify in a court of law. They still could not go into the temple to worship God. They still were considered thieves and the lowest of the low. But they went back and it says the shepherds returned glorifying, praising God for all they had heard and seen and at, at, as it had been, been told them. They've, they found and seen the baby Jesus as the angels recounted. The shepherds left to return to shepherding. And it's important to note that the glory of God does in our day in, day out worlds, it continues to change us. It continues to work on us. But our social uh, standing won't change necessarily. The struggles that we have don't magically usually disappear. If we've got massive amounts of debt or broken relationships in our home, they don't just magically disappear. We can pray that they would. But that isn't usually how it works. It's not like all of the sudden, since they'd seen the glory of God and heard the angels, that now they can do things completely differently, yet they're still rejoicing. And that's what the glory of God does. It injects this gratitude so that in the highs and the lows of our lives, this joy actually becomes a foundational element of our lives. It doesn't matter what our circumstances are. We're still filled with joy. That's the Christian experience. Having beheld the glory of God, ultimately aware of how good and how gracious God has been to us, so regardless of life's circumstances, we see the glory of God. We're more attuned to that still, small voice. God invades our space. And here is the truth. Having experienced the grace of God, we've experienced the generosity of God. And we should be more aware of what is good and right in our world. Rather than being an expert, and I see this all too often, on what's wrong with our world. When we learn to be grateful, we start to see uh, with the eyes of the glory of God and recognize the good in our world. And that will start to change our lives. Think about the difference If we went home and looked at our spouses and just said, God, I am so grateful you gave them to me. If we looked at our children and said, Lord, I am so grateful and pointed out all of the things to them that are good about them instead of being critical of everything that we see that we don't like about them. We've got to be experts on what is good, not experts on what is bad. Think about what happens when you're dialed into the billions of ways that God is good and merciful to you rather than the one area in your life that you feel totally like he's missed it. You know, I just have to wonder, if I gave you a piece of paper right now, if you would fill it up with more complaints about what's going on in your life than blessings. I charge you, I challenge you to think about that because we need to be intimately inflamed with the zeal of how God has been good to us and the gift that other people are to us and the kindness of the Lord that is upon us. In 2 Corinthians, it says this, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. So in other words, in beholding Jesus, beholding the glory of God, the weight of God, and by beholding the glory of God, we are being transformed one degree at a time into the image of God. One degree at a time, day after day after day after day. 
It's in the routine today being faithful to gather with the saints. Just the fact that you showed up at church here today, that is a degree that your life can change. If you'll take a pearl from what has been said today, what has happened in this place, and you'll apply it to your life. I'm 30 plus years from initially seeing and feeling the glory of God, the weight of God on my life. And if you'd have told me 30 plus years ago that I'd be where I am today, I'd have laughed at you. I'd have just literally had a real breakdown laughing moment. But you know what? 30 plus years later, the bondage is gone and uh, some of it that's still around is losing its grip. The sin that overwhelmed me no longer is a giant in my life, but something I'm able to withstand and oftentimes defeat. And there's great joy in my life. Great joy in my life. The glory of God brings that to us. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity this day to come into this place and to recognize that your presence is always there for us. Always there. Lord, I pray for us because we oftentimes miss that. So I pray that you tune our hearts and our minds to that still small voice. Lord, that we would be more aware of the great gifts that you've showered on us. And Lord, for those of us that are in places of pain right now, those of us that are in places of hurt, that we would recognize not just those places of pain and places of hurt, but things that we could do and be to recognize your glory, to embrace what you've done in our doing, and to move away from that pain and into healing, into wholeness, because that's your intent for us, that we would be whole, that we would be able to praise and worship you freely, that joy would be a part of our life. Move us to that place. And I just, as I was preparing this message and heads are bowed and eyes are closed, uh, I, I think that there's some of you in this room who have truly been in a difficult place very possibly or your, your head's been wrapped around all the broken negative things that are going on in your life and I just want to offer you an opportunity uh, by way of allowing you to respond if you'd like to let go of that brokenness and that negativity and, and grab hold of the glory of God and, and step into a place of joy if that's you heads are bowed and eyes are closed would you just raise your hand and say that's me would you see these hands? Yeah, you see these hands, Lord. You know every circumstance, Lord. I love that about you. Nothing is hidden. We've heard that already. So move. Move powerfully in each of these situations. Move the darkness away and bring your light into that circumstance. As those shepherds were just laying there with their sheep that night and you turned the volume up. Turn the volume up on your glory on these who have raised their hands, Lord. Turn the volume up. I always give this opportunity as heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you've walked in here today and are yet to say yes to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity. So all I'm going to ask you to do is to raise your hand. You've never made that commitment. You've never asked Jesus to come into your life. You realize right now you want to do that. You actually want to start following him. Would you lift your hand and say, that's me? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Well, Father, I rejoice in who you are. I'm so grateful and so thank you, thankful for these people. Now, they are your image bearers. They are your ambassadors. So as we walk from this place today, Remind us that as we pray that you would send workers into the harvest that we might in fact be those workers that you're sending into the harvest. Show us how to do that, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you for coming.